my gosh, I'm totally embarrassed. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fisher. Um, really great to be here. Um, so uh, my name is Peter Shearstone. I'm the Vice President of Global Quality and Regulatory for Thermo Fisher Scientific. We're in Waltham, Mass, and uh, all over the world, actually, 314 different plants. So I, you know, I handed my card out to a bunch of folks earlier today, but if I didn't get to see you, please stop and say hi afterwards. Um, we're looking for good employees and interns, depending upon your year um, in the university. Um, I'm really pleased today to introduce um, Jason Brown, Dr. Jason Brown um, at the Darwin Festival. I was here uh, at where you're sitting uh, back in 1985. Um, and the big topic then was AIDS, of course. And, and now we know that we can treat AIDS. And I think about Webb, your presentation today and how fantastic it would be that maybe not 35 years later, maybe it's five years from now, we'll be talking about a cure for ALS, right? It was an amazing presentation earlier. Um, along with an another amazing presentation is Dr. Jason Brown. I'm gonna introduce Dr. Brown. Uh, Dr. Brown earned his BS in genetics and a PhD in cellular biology from the University of Georgia. Go Bulldogs, go dogs. Uh, taught biology at Young Harris College for seven years. Uh, he was a postdoc associate at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He's been a part-time lecturer in the Department of Biology at Tufts, Jumbos. So you've had Bulldogs, Jumbos. Uh, UMass is the, what is UMass's mascot? The, the Viking? Oh, Salem State's Vikings. The UMass. Minutemen. I think it's the Minutemen. Minutemen. Um, yes. Dr. Brown's been at Salem State since 2014, and during the fall of 2020, he was tenured and promoted to associate professor. Dr. Brown's research applies genetics, biochemistry, and cell biology to study the assembly and function of cilia. These hair-like organelles, and Ann Barker's gonna get an education here in what hair-like organelles are, extend from the surface of almost every cell in the human body, and are required for processes to drive, uh, as to drive uh, diverse processes as respiration, reproduction, vision, and embryonic development. Uh, Dr. Brown will discuss cilia assembly, the ciliopath ciliopathies, and the work he and his students have been doing to understand the me mechanism of cilia gene regulation in his talk. And this talk is sponsored by the biology department and Thermo Fisher. So I'll pass it over to Laura for an additional introduction to Dr. Brown. Yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone, and hello to our online audience as well. So you, you already heard great things about Dr. Jason Brown in this introduction, and you might be impressed even before he starts speaking. Uh, well, he has over 22 years of teaching experience. And when I was talking to him about that, he said that it made him feel really old. Um, with that being said, most of our students are younger than 22. So, <laughs> so his mentoring experience goes back all the way to 1999, and his honors and awards started into 1993 when he was a presidential scholar at UGA. That's a fun fact for you guys. He has been investing in his teaching by attending multiple meetings and workshops, and his scholarly success is demonstrated with over 16 publications. With all this success, you who might not know him in person might feel a little intimidated, and I'm here to share with you a few words about him in addition to the accomplishments on his CV. Dr. Brown is a great colleague. He cares for his peers and students, and is always trying to help everyone around him. He comes in early, leaves late, and always has time to lend a hand. He's respectful and respected, sympathizes with others, and many times has worked above and beyond his required job description to help students and faculty who are still learning the ropes like myself. In the few years I have known him, I have seen firsthand how well he collaborates, teaches, learns, and most importantly, focus on his goal, which is improving learning the classroom and lab. It is a great honor to introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Jason Brown. I'll get these things out of the way. Thank you so much for the introduction. Wow. Um, so um, thanks to the biology department uh, and to the Darwin Festival Committee for uh, inviting me to speak. Thanks to Thermo Fisher Scientific and, and the biology department for sponsoring the talk and thanks to you all for being here and the online audience as well. Um, so when I was uh, thinking about preparing this talk, I thought a lot about 
what it means to do research at a primarily teaching uh, oriented institution. And uh, for me, it's really about the students. And so uh, in addition to um, talking to you about Cilia today, I want to talk to you about uh, experiences that I've had over the years with a number of really outstanding uh, undergraduate researchers. And um, so we'll start out um, talking about the significance and structure of cilia. Um, I'll talk to you about a uh, couple of really important research questions in this field, namely, uh, how are cilia assembled and how is the motility of cilia generated and regulated? And then really the bulk of the talk um, is gonna be uh, three kind of vignettes about undergraduate researchers, sort of snapshots of uh, experiences that I've had uh, with undergraduate researchers over the years, including Webb in the back of the room. So, uh, so uh, cilia were first, um, were first described uh, about 345 years ago uh, when Lewin Hook, using really high quality microscopes that he had made himself, um, saw single cell eukaryotic organisms uh, under the microscope. And he described those as animalcules and the um, cilia that he saw in those organisms as these incredibly thin little feet or little legs. The cilia that you're seeing at the bottom of the screen here um, are actually ependymal cilia, which um, extend out from glial cells in a mouse brain in this case. Uh, and this is work from Carl Lechtrek uh, working in George Whitman's lab at the University of Massachusetts Medical School when he was there. He's now at the University of Georgia. Go dogs. Uh, <laughs> um, and then uh, it was actually almost exactly 300 years later when the first disease um, caused by immodal cilia uh, was described by Axelius. And uh, the patients with this uh, immodal cilia syndrome have uh, uh, chronic sinus and respiratory infections. Uh, they're infertile. And uh, kind of amazingly, about half of them have something called situs inversus totalis. And this is a rare condition where the um, abdominal and thoracic organs are in a mirror image position relative to the normal positions uh, of the organs. So in 2000, um, the field or the connection between uh, cilia and diseases really started to take off as a, an interesting research area when uh, this paper was published looking at a mouse model of polycystic kidney disease. So uh, PKD is um, affects somewhere between uh, one in 500 and one in a thousand uh, live births. And um, people who uh, have polycystic kidney disease typically uh, need to go on dialysis or end up needing a kidney transplant. So on the right, you're looking at uh, a, a normal human kidney in the center. And these are kidneys uh, of people with polycystic kidney disease. Um, so you can see it's a really dramatic effect on the kidneys. Um, in this same study, they found that um, the gene that was mutated in their mouse model of polycystic kidney disease was this gene TG737. And the other thing that they found was that a mutation in the homologous gene to that one uh, in this single-celled organism, Chlamydomonas reinhardii, caused this organism, which is a single-celled green alga, to lack its cilia. And um, so, of course, they immediately went and looked in the kidneys in their mice to see if they saw any cilia defects. And um, what they found was inside the kidney collecting duct tubules, um, there were cilia extending out from the surfaces of the cells in that tubule. Um, but in the mutant mouse, they, the cilia were either completely missing or very much reduced. So at this point, researchers got really excited about the possibility 
that there might be other diseases that are caused by problems with cilia other than just immortal cilia syndrome. And um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that they got so excited about this is that um, cilia are found on virtually every cell in the human body. So um, they're not found on red blood cells, but basically just about every other cell uh, in the body. So the cilia in humans come in two varieties, the modal cilia and uh, the primary cilia or the immodal cilia. So for the modal cilia, um, they include the ependymal cilia that I just showed you a minute ago, as well as uh, oviduct cilia, nodal cilia, uh, and respiratory cilia, which are all moving fluids across the surfaces of cells, uh, and sperm flagella, which are moving whole cells. The uh, primary cilia, which are the ones that are not beating, they actually just extend out from the surfaces of cells and they act like a little antenna to receive signals from other cells. Um, those include uh, olfactory cilia in our nose, which uh, are packed with odorant receptors that um, allow the sense of smell. And uh, the photoreceptor outer segments in the eye, which are packed with visual pigments um, that allow vision. Um, and those kidney collecting duct cilia that I mentioned uh, before, among many others. I'm just showing you a few examples here. Um, so it now it turns out that now uh, we know that there are uh, a variety of human diseases um, that are caused by problems with cilia. In fact, this whole class of diseases is now called the ciliopathies. And um, ciliopathies include uh, diseases that are caused by problems with modal cilia. In those cases, uh, people have uh, infertility, uh, and that's due to the uh, inability of the oviduct cilia to, to move egg cells uh, and uh, the uh, inability of sperm cells to swim. Also, uh, chronic sinus and respiratory infections. And sometimes those can actually be so severe that um, it causes scarring of the lungs, which is called bronchiectasis. Um, and then that left-right asymmetry defect that I mentioned before, where the organs are in this mirror image position, that's actually caused by problems with um, cilia on the embryonic node, which is the structure on the surface of the embryo that's involved in establishing the left-right asymmetry um, during embryonic development. Hydrocephalus is an accumulation of fluid in the brain um, that's caused by a problem with those ependymal cilia that I showed you before, which is involved in moving cerebrospinal fluid around. Um, the uh, disorders that are caused by problems with the primary cilia uh, include cystic kidneys, blindness, obesity, and skeletal and nervous system abnormalities, which are all the common theme there is they're um, caused by problems with signaling that those um, cilia are involved in. So one of the other things that explains why cilia can have so many different effects uh, on uh, our health is that um, cilia are really complicated structures. So they're made out of hundreds of different proteins uh, and uh, they're organized though all around microtubules, which are composed of alpha and beta tubulin subunits that are uh, organized into these helical filaments that are part of the cytoskeleton in the cell. The core of cilia is called the axoneme, and uh, it's composed in both the non-modal cilia, which are like the ones on the top, and the modal cilia uh, on the bottom here. They have nine uh, microtubule doublets that are arranged into a cylinder uh, around the outside. And in the modal cilia, there's also this structure called the central pair and uh, a number of other structures like outer, inner and outer dining arms and radial spokes um, that are involved in generating and regulating the motility of the cilia. So on the left side here, you're gonna see an animation um, that is from cryo-electron tomography work that was 
uh, collaboration between Wind Sales Lab at Emory University and Daniela Nicastro's lab when she was uh, at Brandeis. And what we're looking at is a single one of these microtubule doublets over here with the, uh, on this side, the outer dining arms and on this side over here, the inner dining arms. And then these uh, structures sticking out on this side are these radial spoke structures that you're looking at over here. So we're looking at just one of these doublet microtubules and just a very short part of one of those doublet microtubules. So that hopefully gives you kind of a sense of the complexity of these organelles. The axoneme is um, covered by the ciliary membrane, which has a distinct lipid and protein composition from the plasma membrane, but it's connected to and is continuous with the plasma membrane. So there's this region at the base of the cilia that keeps them sort of separate and determines that distinction between the plasma membrane and the ciliary membrane. So really importantly, that superstructure that I'm showing you there, as well as the proteins that are found in the cilia are really highly conserved between different eukaryotic organisms. And so what you're looking at here are uh, electron micrographs of cross sections of cilia um, from human and chlamydomonas, that single celled green algae that I just showed you a few minutes ago. So I hope you would agree, it's kind of difficult to tell them apart from each other, right? So it turns out on the left is the human cilium and on the right is the Clamidomonas uh, cilium. In fact, um, it turns out that cilia are found in uh, every major lineage of eukaryotic organisms. And um, what that tells us is that the last uh, common ancestor of all eukaryotes uh, was almost certainly a ciliated organism. The other reason that's important is because it means that we can use a variety of different model organisms to study cilia uh, function and assembly. So for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on uh, organisms in two clades here, the alveolates, which uh, include ciliates, and uh, chloroplastida, which includes the green algae. So uh, these are movies of these two organisms slowed down dramatically so that you can actually see the cilia. Um, on the left is uh, a ciliate, Tetrahymena of Thermophila, which is covered with hundreds of cilia. You can see a few of them in focus uh, around the outside edge of the cell, but the whole cell is covered with hundreds of cilia. And on the right is Clamidomonas reinhardii, which is uh, that green alga that I introduced you to before that um, swims through its media by pulling itself forward with this kind of breaststroke-like motion. And just to give you a sense of how much we're slowing these movies down, that's Clamidomonas swimming in real time. Um, so we slow them down a lot so that you can see them. Um, so the two questions that I'm going to um, kind of focus on for the rest of the talk here are uh, how are cilia assembled and how is that motility of the cilia generated and regulated? Um, and both of those organisms that I just showed you have been used to study these questions over the years. So I'd like to start with the first of those questions talking about cilia assembly. And um, during the process of building a cilium, a cell needs to transcribe and translate hundreds of genes. The proteins that are made are assembled into uh, many different protein complexes and they get transported to the cilium and then transported into the cilium to their sites of assembly so that the um, cilia can then grow. What we now know is that uh, many of those proteins are um, actually transported into the cilia. Oh, let me back up and say one thing. We, uh, cells need to have a mechanism to get these proteins into cilia and transported in the cilia because proteins are not made in cilia. There's no ribosomes or protein making machinery inside the cilia. So all of those hundreds of different proteins have to get made in the cell body and then transported into the cilia to where they go. So over on the right side, um, you're looking at an immobilized Clamidomonas cilium. 
And uh, this process called intraflagellar transport, which is this bi-directional movement of protein particles from the base of the cilia out toward the tip. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about intraflagellar transport more in a couple of minutes. This is gonna bring us to our uh, three undergraduate research vignettes. Um, so in the first of these, uh, I'm going to take you all the way back to my PhD training days. And um, during my PhD, I studied kinesin motor proteins. So motor proteins use the energy from ATP to um, walk along cytoskeletal filaments in the cell. And uh, when they do, they uh, carry cargo with them. Um, so in this picture from uh, Ron Vale's lab that they put together to illustrate this process, this car is carrying the cargo along the filament, right? Uh, so the motor proteins do that and they have lots of different really important functions. So they're carrying uh, secretory vesicles in the cell. They're moving uh, chromosomes around during mitosis. And uh, they're actually in the cilium, they're causing filaments to slide against each other. Uh, within the axoneme, which is the mechanism for ciliary beating. So most of the projects that I do start with mutants and um, in uh, just to kind of orient you to the complexity of this problem of making and, and sort of isolating these mutants, um, the organisms that I'm talking about range from having about 17,000 genes in Chlamydomonas to uh, in tetrahymenous cells having about 26,000 genes and humans kind of fall right about in the middle of that with around 20,000 genes. So you all uh, probably know that, uh, that a variety of different genes will code for proteins with different important functions in the cell like catalyzing chemical reactions or regulating the expression of uh, of other genes or signaling from cell to cell. And in both of those organisms, tetrahymena and chlamydomonas, there are mechanisms or methods available to generate mutations in uh, genes. When we do that, uh, very often the function of proteins will be disrupted. And then we can look to see what the effect of the cell is on the cell is to try to build a biological story basically and understand uh, what the function of that protein is. So when uh, I was a PhD student with Jacek Gertig at the University of Georgia, um, we created um, a mutant that was totally lacking this motor protein called kinesin-2. And um, so this is in, uh, in tetrahymena. And um, when we did immunofluorescence microscopy, Thank you, Webb, for that wonderful introduction earlier. Any of you that were here for Webb's talk, you did a great intro to immunofluorescence microscopy. Um, when we did immunofluorescence microscopy on these cells, um, we could stain the tubulin inside the cilia with one color, the green that you're seeing here, uh, and the DNA inside the nucleus in this other color, in blue. Um, and what we found is that wild type cells, as I said, are covered with hundreds of different cilia. And our mutant uh, was unable to assemble new cilia during division, but it's also unable to maintain its existing cilia. So that was interesting and exciting, but we got really excited and interested when we realized that the mutant also had um, a defect in uh, cell division. So on the left side is a normal uh, cell dividing, and you can see that um, during division, the cell builds a new oral apparatus, which is the feeding structure uh, of these cells. And what that does for us is it helps us very easily uh, get oriented to what the front cell and the back cell are. So what you can see on the right side is that uh, mutant cells had divided their nuclei normally, right? So the nuclei divided as they should, but the um, cell bodies weren't dividing uh, normally. 
In fact, if we let these cells grow for longer, they would make these massive monster cells that had multiple nuclei in them. So they had clearly failed to divide uh, multiple times during that process. Um, so the interesting question um, at, at this point, we wanted to dig into um, the, the problem with cell division further and try to understand uh, what was happening with that. So we used um, live cell imaging to take pictures of cells during cell division. And if you look on the left side here, you see that from the time that wild type cells started making a cleavage furrow until they completely divided was only about 15 or 20 minutes, right? We could watch this process. Um, but if we looked at the mutant cells, the thing that was interesting is that they went almost to the end, right? The cleavage furrow almost completed, um, but around 25 minutes, most of the cells, even though they had almost finished their cleavage furrow, hadn't completely divided yet. If we looked at later time points, we could actually start to see those mutant cells fusing back together to make those monsters that we um, had observed. So the question at this point um, that we thought was interesting is, are, is that kinesin-2 motor protein that we had disrupted directly involved in cell division somehow? Or is it a more indirect effect that we're seeing? And so um, in steps our first undergraduate. So this is uh, Frank Harden, who was an undergraduate student at UGA at the time who uh, was doing a project, an independent project as part of his cell biology lab course. And um, he decided to tackle this problem about cell division with me as part of that project. And uh, what we did is use video microscopy of live dividing cells. And if you see on the left side, this is the anterior daughter cell, almost at the end of division. It's not moving. That posterior daughter cell that you just saw is spinning dramatically. So let me go back and show that to you again. So that cell on the left is the anterior daughter. It's stuck in place. The daughter cell on the right is the posterior and it's spinning like this. So, uh, and notice that's right before the cells um, split. So, um, we uh, hypothesized at this point that this process that we are observing, which we call rotokinesis, um, actually helps to weaken the bridge between the daughter cells at the very end of cell division, and that, um, that the problem with these cells, with the mutant cells, was actually that they couldn't divide because they couldn't do that process. So that was just a hypothesis, but we needed to test that hypothesis, right? So uh, the first thing we did was to take wild type cells and actually inhibit their motility by putting them into a viscous, like really thick media that they couldn't swim through. Uh, under those conditions, the cleavage furrow was normal, but if you notice here, at later time points, there was often this long membrane bridge that was connecting the cells. So it really did look like motility was important for these cells to be able to divide, but that wasn't enough because we also said, well, if that's true, then what if we just add motility to our mutants? Can we get them to divide normally? So um, we did that. We just put the mutant cells in a shaking culture. And it turns out just by doing that, we could get them to divide almost normally. So this is the mutant with shaking and this is the mutant without shaking, making those huge monster cells. So that was, we felt like pretty good support for uh, this idea that motility is important for that organism to divide. So just to conclude this part, um, kinesin-2 was required for cilia assembly and maintenance in tetrahymena. Tetrahymena uses this highly coordinated kind of dance, this rotokinesis process to complete cell division. And the kinesin-2 mutants fail to divide normally, we think, because they lack the ability to do that rotokinesis process. Uh, it turns out since then, there have been a number of different papers that have been published on uh, motility-assisted cytokinesis processes in other types of organisms as well. Um, so this is not a one-off. This happens in, in other organisms. So I'm gonna, for these vignettes, I'm gonna do a little where are they now for these people. Um, 
So Frank uh, completed his bachelor's, uh, master's and PhD degrees in cellular biology at the University of Georgia, and later went on to found and run uh, for several years, a youth education program at uh, the Noble Research Institute in Oklahoma. And he's now a licensing associate at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. So thanks, Frank. Um, so for our second vignette, we're gonna switch uh, organisms, we're gonna switch research questions, and we're gonna switch institutions. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, a question about the regulation of motility in Chlamydomonas reinhardii uh, that started as uh, a project that I was working on when I was a postdoc at UMass Medical School. Um, but then that project basically transitioned to Salem State when I came here. Uh, and I've had a number of um, students work on that over the years. So at this point, it's important to understand that in Chlamydomonas, we can generate mutants by um, introducing a DNA fragment that goes in and it lands in a random place in the genome. So we're making random mutations by this. And if we happen to hit a gene that's important for the function of cilia, we can screen out those mutants by looking for defects in swimming or the inability to assemble cilia at all. Um, and um, when I was a postdoc at UMass, I did a lot of this mutant screening and I generated quite a few of these mutants. I generated so many of those mutants that I couldn't handle them all. So I sent out a number of these mutants to other labs um, that I thought might be interested in those. And so one of those mutants that I sent um, to a, a colleague, Maureen Warshell at the University of Mississippi Medical Center um, was a Chlamydomonas mutant that had a slow swimming phenotype that suggested that it might have a defect in those outer dining arms that I mentioned to you before. So just to remind you about outer dining arms, they're attached to those outer microtubule doublets in the axoneme. And what they're doing is what this uh, is showing you on the left here, they are uh, on one end of the dynene. They're attached to one of the microtubules in the axoneme. And on the other end, they're walking along another microtubule that's adjacent to them. So what the effect of that is, is that the microtubules are sliding against each other like this. That's the mechanism behind the ciliary beating. Um, that I showed you before. So that movement of cilia is about sliding of microtubules against each other. So uh, on the right, you're seeing a schematic of the outer dining arm. It's a super complicated structure just by itself. It's made up of multiple different proteins. It's anchored at the base by a structure called the outer dining arm docking complex, which is made of three different proteins called DC1, DC2, and DC3. And before I jump to the next slide, I just want to um, kind of orient you very quickly to the nomenclature because it, it could get a little confusing. The protein here is called DC1. So that's what I'm showing you there. The gene is called DCC1. And our mutant allele that we generated is called ODA3-6. That's just like a nomenclature thing that we didn't have anything to do with. We're following the guidelines for nomenclature. Uh, so um, in Maureen Rochelle's lab, our collaborator, they used Western blotting. Thanks, Webb, for the introduction on that earlier, too. Um, basically, all you need to understand about Western blotting here is that it's a way to look for the presence of specific proteins. Um, and so if you um, look in the wild type cells um, where we're looking for this DC1 protein, you see that the wild type cells have DC1, right? The mutant, which is our ODA3-6 mutant over here, is lacking that DC1 protein and also lacking the DC2 protein, which is the other one uh, here. And um, that is actually very similar to a previously identified ODA mutant, uh, ODA3-1. 
So that suggested that we might have a mutation in one of those genes, maybe in DC1 or DC2. And so what uh, Maureen's lab did at that point was to use uh, the polymerase chain reaction or PCR to uh, basically look at the structure of the DCC2 gene and the DCC1 gene in this uh, mutant to see if they could find the defect. If you're not uh, used to looking at polymerase chain reaction or thinking about that, all you really need to understand at this point is that it's a method that allows us to look for segments of DNA and determine whether they're there. And so like here, we're looking for this segment that's between these two arrowheads, which if you are familiar with PCR, those are the PCR primer pairs. Um, and so what they found was, uh, oh yeah, and I was gonna say also, this is uh, basically like uh, PCR-based COVID testing, right? Where you're looking for a sequence of uh, the viral nucleic acid uh, by PCR in this case. So what they found was that when they looked at the DCC2 gene, it was totally normal. They didn't see any problems with that. The DCC1 gene was almost normal throughout the whole gene, but at the very um, beginning of the gene, there were some uh, problems that we could see on a gel. So um, in this uh, diagram, this is looking at the products of this PCR reaction. So really all you need to notice is that in this region where these dotted lines are, um, there is a difference between wild type and mutant. So here, wild type and mutant look different. Here, wild type and mutant look different. Wild type, mutant look different. Here, they look pretty similar. There is a band about that same size, but uh, Wershel's lab, they sequenced that band and actually found that it wasn't the, it wasn't the DCC1 uh, gene in that region. It was a nonspecific, uh, PCR product. So this is when uh, Daniela Montez Berrueta joined my uh, research group, and um, Daniela, her uh, idea was to basically analyze that mutant further and try to get down to the molecular details of that mutant and understand what's going on at the molecular level. And her idea was to use PCR primers that are inside that inserted DNA in combination with uh, the primers that were in the DCC1 gene flanking that insertion site. Do PCR to generate uh, the PCR products here and then sequence that, determine the order of the bases in that uh, the PCR products that she generated and then analyze those sequences to try to figure out the, the molecular details there. So when she did that, she figured out that there was a 12 base pair deletion from the five prime untranslated region of the um, DCC1 gene, which is on chromosome 17. And at that site, the uh, selectable marker DNA that we expected to find there was there, so that was kind of good. It told us that that probably was the site of our mutation. Um, but interestingly, there's also a piece of Chlamydomonas chromosome six that was inserted in that same site. And maybe even more interestingly, um, there was a 500 base pair region of, um, of kind of poor sequence quality. It didn't give us great sequence information, but what we got out of it was um, that it was about 88% identical to the human RB1 gene. Um, so what we think is going on there is that during the process of generating that mutant, some human DNA actually got uh, introduced as a contaminating, uh, contaminating sequence that got introduced uh, at that location. So this is, was important because this is actually the first uh, of these ODA3 mutants that had, ever been, uh, that had ever been characterized at that level of molecular detail. And um, uh, Daniela ended up as a, a co-author on this paper that we published on this mutant. So that was exciting. So in the where are they now segment, so Daniela is now a senior research associate in virology and infectious disease at Moderna. Uh, and the couple of publications that you can see here um, show you that she's um, really been 
kind of at the forefront of helping to develop some of the vaccines against COVID variants uh, of late. So this is gonna take us to our last of these vignettes. Uh, and in this, uh, we're gonna talk about um, some genetic techniques that we're trying to implement to think about this uh, process of um, cilia assembly again. So just to remind you, during cilia assembly, there are hundreds of genes that get turned on. And what we're trying to answer here is what flips the switch? Um, how do these uh, genes get regulated all at the same time so that they can build cilia? So it turns out that Clemenomonas is a great organism for uh, answering this question because we can get these cells to express these genes uh, in the lab simultaneously uh, in a whole population of cells by getting the cells to lose their cilia and then regrow those cilia. And uh, we can do this really easily with just a brief exposure to acidic conditions. Cells drop their cilia and then we return the cells to neutral and they regrow uh, at that point and those genes are expressed during that time. Um, so you can see here in this graph of cilia length versus time uh, that these cells are able to regrow almost full length cilia within about 90 minutes. So it makes it really practical to do this in the lab with undergraduate students, right? Between classes, we can do these kind of experiments. Um, so during my uh, time as a postdoc in George Whitman's lab at UMass Medical School, I developed a system uh, for us to actually be able to follow gene expression uh, in these cells during uh, the time that they're regrowing. And so the system is based in part on the coding region um, from a gene from a marine crustacean called Gaussia princeps um, that's involved in the bioluminescence of this organism. So it allows these cells to glow uh, basically in the water. And uh, when the g loop protein is expressed uh, from that, which is this Gaussia luciferase protein, when that's expressed from that coding region, and then you expose that enzyme to its substrate, selenorazine, it releases light. And so we can do this in the lab. Um, and the idea was to connect up a promoter, which is kind of a regulatory region for the gene to that um, coding region for that Gaussia luciferase, and then put that whole thing into Clementomonas cells, get the cells to regrow their cilia like I just showed you, and um, during cilia regrowth, those cells would produce the luciferase and we'd be able to detect it um, and as a way to look at the expression of these genes in those cells. So it turned out that system worked really nicely. Um, so if you look on the bottom here, this is a graph of a population of cells uh, regrowing their cilia after deciliation. And uh, in that same population of cells, we're looking at the luciferase activity uh, in cells expressing that luciferase construct. And in green here are the mock treated cells. So you can see they didn't lose their cilia and they also don't upregulate the luciferase. So around 60 minutes after deciliation, uh, we get this really nice peak of that uh, luciferase activity. So now that we had a way to look at the um, gene expression, we wanted to um, try to use a couple of different approaches to tackle this problem. So the first of these is forward genetics. And in the forward genetics approach, it's like what I showed you before, we randomly mutate the cell. And then the idea was to look for mutants that didn't upregulate that luciferase expression anymore. So we had disrupted that pathway somehow. Uh, and kind of importantly and interestingly, um, those cells very often regrew their cilia really slowly. So sometimes we could also just screen for slow regrowth of cilia uh, as another thing to look for. And uh, because these are random mutations in the cells, we then need to go try to figure out where the genes are. Um, and a couple of students that worked really hard on this, among others, but a couple of the students that worked really hard on this uh, were Ellen uh, Achenpong and Webb Camille. And um, Ellen 
during her uh, honors thesis work, screened about 3,000 uh, randomly generated mutants. And among those, 14 of them had this delayed regrowth phenotype that she was looking for. And two of them appeared to be really interesting because they looked like they were signaling proteins, which could be in this pathway somehow of regulating these genes. Um, but when we dug into those mutants further, um, it turns out that um, those genes were not actually mutated in those mutant strains. I showed you before, we get these complicated inserts in Chromomonas in these mutants, and it turns out that that sometimes makes it kind of difficult to identify these insertion sites a little bit. Um, and Webb uh, also did some work on this uh, and screened about a thousand mutants, and uh, when uh, he did the PCR and sequencing on these. Basically, um, they were in known cilia proteins, which were interesting, but uh, we were pushing hard to try to identify new pathways that hadn't been identified before. So we didn't follow up on those uh, mutants further. So we don't have any like major breakthroughs to report from the forward genetics approach at this point, but it's still a really promising approach and I think uh, could be really important. So. Uh, Ellen is now a third year uh, PhD candidate in microbiology and physiological systems at UMass Chan Medical School. And those of you that saw Webb's talk earlier uh, know that he's currently a fourth year MD PhD candidate in biochemistry and molecular biotechnology at UMass Chan Medical School as well. All right, so we're nearly there. In the reverse genetics approach, the idea is we identify genes that we think are interesting, and then we go in and make targeted mutations in those genes. So not random mutations, but targeted mutations. And the, um, the idea here was that we were gonna use either biochemical or uh, bioinformatics methods to try to identify the uh, candidate genes and then use a CRISPR-based approach to try to um, disrupt those genes. And so it turns out that um, we decided to go with the CRISPR uh, first, just to show that we could do it here in our lab at Salem State uh, before we dug in to try to identify the candidate genes. And so uh, a paper was published in two, uh, 2020 by George Whitman's lab and some of his collaborators basically showing that you could do CRISPR efficiently in Chlamydomonas, um, which had not been the case prior to that. And what Gladia Solly, when she joined the uh, research group, was gonna do was basically disrupt this FAP70 gene by inserting uh, a hygromycin resistance cassette or a piece of DNA that confers resistance to hygromycin in the middle of the gene. For any of you that don't uh, know about CRISPR, basically there are three parts. There's a nuclease that makes a cut in the gene, and then there are these two RNAs that are involved in um, getting the nuclease to the DNA. So the nuclease enzyme binds to the DNA, opens it up, and makes this double-stranded cut at that site. Um, so the idea in Gladia's project was she was going to uh, start with the FAP70 gene, uh, target the Cas9 enzyme to the FAP70 gene to make that cut, and then uh, take that hygromycin resistance cassette and add some FAP70 sequences onto the end of it, and then get it to insert uh, in the middle of the FAP70 gene. We decided to do FAP70. It's a a uh, gene that encodes part of the central pair in Chlamydomonas axoneme, but mainly we did it because that's the gene that, uh, one of the genes that the Whitman lab had targeted in their paper. So she was just trying to repeat what they had done essentially. And uh, it worked. Uh, that's the short story here. Basically, um, she tested out some of the strains that she generated with the polymerase chain reaction. And again, um, by amplifying with these pairs of primers in wild type cells, she expected to get something that was about 317 base pairs, which she saw very nicely in the wild type. So these are wild type cells here. Um, but in the mutant, she expected to see either no band between those primers or um, a larger fragment because that hygromycin piece got inserted in the middle of the gene. So what did she see? 
uh, with her FAP70 primers, only four out of the 17 strains uh, that she tested had the normal wild type sequence. So that meant that 13 out of the 17 strains were either completely missing that sequence or had that two kilobase uh, insert approximately that she was expecting to see in the mutants. So it really looks like uh, that she was successful in getting CRISPR to work at Salem State. Um, the mutation rate that she got was about 76%, which is comparable to what uh, Whitman Lab had shown before. So that was really uh, exciting. Gladia is now a research technician in the Fanning Lab uh, in the Department of Neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, and she is working on Parkinson's disease. Um, and so just next steps uh, really quickly, a larger genetic screen potentially. Um, and for that reverse genetics method, um, identifying genes to try to target with the CRISPR uh, system that we've got working now. So either a biochemical approach or a bioinformatics approach. And uh, Campbell Boisvert is, uh, has been working with me this year since the beginning of the year, trying to do the bioinformatics approach to identify uh, those candidate genes. So I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the long list of uh, other students and a colleague who has worked uh, on this project a little bit with me um, and uh, other mentors and students. And all of the funding for the Salem State part of this work has come for, from the uh, MSCA Fund for Continuing Scholarship as well as uh, to uh, an SSU mini grant and a flash grant uh, that I was awarded for this work. Um, I couldn't do a talk about undergraduate research without honoring my mentors when I was an undergraduate researcher. Uh, Mary Case gave me my first start in a research lab uh, and uh, got me going doing research on fungal genetics. Uh, and Michael Bender, who's now at the NIH, uh, introduced me to fruit fly genetics. So I did Drosophila work with him. Uh, so thanks so much to them. And then I'm going to end with this slide. I dug around looking for this to see if this were the case. So uh, when Charles Darwin was at the University of Edinburgh uh, studying, uh, he did work with uh, Robert Grant, who was a marine biologist. And uh, the work was to basically take a microscope and go look at marine life in the local area. And uh, in March of 1827, when Darwin was 18 years old, he wrote this in his lab notebook. In this species, I believe I was the first to observe both the animal and its cilia. Yes. Uh, in most rapid movement. By the aid of these cilia, it could revolve in its capsule and when freed from it, move so quickly as to be discernible to the naked eye at some distance. To what animal these over belong, I am ignorant. So if you happen to decide to do undergraduate research, if you happen to do research on cilia, you're in really good company. So thank you very much. Well, I'm 130 people on the webinar, and I'll read uh, the first question. You don't have to repeat it because I'm unmuted at okay. this end. And the question is basically, do you find that being an educator and teaching classes helps you come up with new ideas and, and questions to, to conduct research in the lab? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I teaching genetics and teaching cell biology. I'm all the time having to learn new things, right? Um, and so the 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 types of new cutting edge things I'm having to learn in in teaching genetics all the time are all the time always giving me ideas about new experiments to do. So just very recently, I've been. <laughs> I've had this flood of ideas um, as I was starting to work on this talk, a lot of which have come out of, uh, out of genetics courses and cell biology courses, so definitely.
That was a great talk, by the way. Um, Thanks. So I had a question about doing genetic screens on mutants that harbor mutations in genes that are known to cause genetic diseases or cause the kidney disease. And I'm wondering if that's happening that you plan on going towards here or not? Uh, tackling disease causing genes. Yeah. Um, so there's the potential for that. Um, in the area that we're kind of focusing on now with looking at gene regulation, um, it turns out that gene regulation pathways um, are not super well conserved evolutionarily. There's quite a bit of divergence between um, different evolutionary lineages and that. So we don't know what we'll find in that area. Certainly I'm always have my eyes open for interesting things. Signaling pathways maybe are a little more likely than the direct transcriptional regulators to be evolutionarily conserved. Um, but yeah, I mean, I always have my eyes open for that. One of the things that I always kind of have in my mind with the transcriptional regulation part of it is that um, even if you think find things that are only conserved in ciliates, for instance, or uh, 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 single celled organisms, there are a number of those that are, uh, that are pathogens in humans, right? That cause infectious disease. And so finding a novel pathway that shuts down the ability of a single celled organism to make it cilia, for instance, uh, could be a really interesting therapeutic target for uh, infectious eukaryotic diseases. So. Uh, we have another question, actually, this is from me. <laughs> sure. uh, so if you could repeat it for our online audience. Knowing that we have 130, possibly, hopefully, students online, what do you look for in the ideal student to work in lab with you? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned this a little bit in my introduction to web earlier. Um, you know, I look for students who are um, just have a like sort of a gleam in their eye when they're thinking about and talking about science. I can just see that. I just know uh, they, they have that kind of level of excitement that I felt where I woke up in the middle of the night sometimes when I was in grad school. And even when I was a postdoc, I would sometimes just wake up in the middle of the night going like, Oh, what I'm gonna like having an idea, like an epiphany about my experiment in the middle of the night, right? It happens, yes. You dream about it. Um, and and I can just sort of like when a student comes to talk to me, I kind of get a sense of if you have that kind of level of excitement. Um, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for um the a little bit of uh, sort of confidence on your part. I don't mean you have to be super confident, but you have to be confident enough to just go to a faculty member and ask, right? To say like, I am i don't really know what research is about, so I'm not super confident about that, but I'm at least confident enough to come talk to you about it and, and have a conversation. If I see those two things, I'm, I'm good. That's about all I need. We'll we'll sit and talk for a while and so.